So, our second feature, Daniel Maluka, is a self-taught Toronto-based artist and writer originating from South Africa. In ben blending Afrocentric influences with surreal elements, he showcases the depths of the subconscious. He, his visually captivating pieces have granted international recognition, featuring in galleries across Toronto and selling to collectors worldwide. In the realm of literature, Daniel has been published in various magazines and has led poetry workshops. His debut poetry collection, Unwashed, published by Moenzi House, contains visceral and image-rich poetry. Can we get a round of applause for Daniel? <laughs> So, uh, really glad to be here, to be featuring at Art Bar. Art Bar is a pretty magical place. I met one of my literary heroes here, Rawi Hodge. Yeah, it's really, really, it's really, really a privilege to be here. So, I'll be reading a few poems from my book. I have some copies here, if anyone's interested. So. Uh, the first one I'm going to read is called The Navigator. When I was a kid, I thought my dad was a spy. He could speak French, listen in Portuguese, and ask about the weather in Russian, shocking me and Walter every time our Chrysler Neon needed a tune-up. When I was a kid, I thought my dad was a spy. He spent a few years in France and would avoid questions. Him in Sanskrit, me in hieroglyphic. We were unintelligible. When I was a kid, I thought my dad was a spy. He knew our city well enough to drive without a GPS. North York, downtown, Etobicoke. But we were unknown to each other. Too many left turns and dead ends. When I grew up, I saw my father for who he was. Willing to argue over the placement of a garbage bin willing to ignore the smell of 3 a.m. weed and Bacardi breath. When I grew up, I understood how frustrating it must be to see your son make the mistakes you did, to have him yield right of way to error, to have your warnings mistranslated. When I grew up, I saw my father for who he was, aware he sent his son into a world that hates him. The next one I'm going to read is called Unwashed Reused. 70% water, 30% falsehood. That's what we are. Through arteries and veins, rocks and ravines, gravity pushed us down further. At the impasse, we separated. Speak now, wave, current, whisper across the distance. Without you, all skies are secondhand, twice worn, unwashed, reused. <laughs> this next one is also pretty short. It's called Birds of Prey. Do you remember the days we spent? Your fluorescent room listening to David Attenborough. His voice escaping through smoke. You know, Hawks are the only birds of prey that hunt in packs. Cloaked in red, you snorted in agreement. Okay. So this one is called Field Notes on the Hermit. I hiked throughout the valley, making sure to be as silent as possible. My ankles and arms marked by mosquito bites, my hair permanently plastered on my forehead. It was on the third day when I saw him. The hermit sits among battered branches, white bark rubbing off on green grass, his pale feet covered by the dirt of the forest, red leaves falling at each stroke of his paintbrush, wine-soaked leaves stain his fingertips. I observed the hermit, either painting or writing, often in the shade of the trees. Submerged in solitary stillness, unaware I watched him, 
looking down only to make field notes, no release valve, pressure of silence envelops him. The hermit has made his bargain with the forest, a man who chose to isolate himself all these years from his friends and family, all others sacrificed for solace, why? No vacancies in this wood, all parts filled by him, his body covered in a mess of green leaves, rotten clothing and blankets, a hat, a tangle of grass held together by thin branches. The scent of the fresh earth clung to him and radiated off him. His heartbeat interwound with the forest, her branches spiral around his body, his disguise merged with the wood. I traveled on the narrow paths worn by his feet. No space for betrayal on moss-covered paths. These mountains, this wood, calm and unyielding. A constant giver of sustenance, warmth, shelter. In my journey throughout the forest, I was surrounded by her emerald flock. I must imagine the hermit is happy. There is no demand the forest makes of you. She is the forever giving partner intimate with each river, valley, and flows, none more welcome than shapely ravines. Every part of the hermit is stitched on her green dress, surrounded by salvation. This one is called uh, Standard Repertoire of the Immigrant Genre. <coughs> the same standards that turned an artist in his own country to a chauffeur in mine. He had his watercolor dreams shapely and pink, his concepts blooming like wild orchids. White petals smeared across the concrete by the reality that if he does not secure capital, his children will go hungry. He is five years over 35. Those grants don't apply anymore. Doesn't have a reference for the new immigrant artist grant. Those concepts from his mind's eye were once as detailed as textiles from Zanjin, exploding in color, now muted, shrunken, and obscured by the veil of overdraft, decline, past due, compound interest. The same standards that turned a musician in his own country to a delivery boy in mine. The notes are unknown to him, but his movements adjust to the standard repertoire. No words, only rhythm in his knock, Gift wrapping, chart topping, fast food. His in-app profile picture fades just like the faces of all the others we reduced. He does gigs here just like back home, at the cultural center or the bar downtown, owned by another immigrant from Kerala. Exhausted by his other jobs, yet he fights to keep hearing the notes. Each pluck on his sitar gives him a new life. Your family or your passion. The music in his head drowned by the shrieking of rent, late fees, service charge, eviction. So, this next one that I'll read is called Apartment Shadows. So, we played basketball in the shadows of our buildings dwarfed by the shadows of older kids. Shadows looming over us in our buildings, swallowing us whole. I left early, but you stayed. In the distant heat of summer's long past, we braved the pressure of the beating sun, chasing after the ice cream truck, breathlessly thumbing through quarters, nickels, and dimes. The price of ice cream rose each summer by nickels first, then dimes, then quarters. As the summers blazed on, I would see you go to the tuck shop. Using dollar bills to buy nickel and dime bags, I thought nothing of it. Our school day memories play back like videotapes, grainy 240 pixel videos in my head. On your walks to school, your mother wanted you to stay close to her. I didn't, but you did. Misbehaving was more your thing than mine. Running from our mothers was more your thing than mine. You embrace the shadows of those older kids. I did it, but you did, and stood in daylight with them, circling the area outside our buildings like sharks, 
Thinking nothing of it, I had things to draw. Years lurched on and my visits to your place were rare. Our Call of Duty zombie days were gone. I wouldn't even see you at school. Your father gave a speech at our Black History Month assembly. He told us black men to break the chains. You weren't there to hear it. You left early. I only saw the picture when I asked around for weed and they brought your name up. I didn't know you were chopping. The night I came back from my first art show, I saw you at the bus station. I had moved away, but you stayed. In the shadow of our aged apartment, windows covered by flags and posters. You told me you were selling white because there's no money in green. With no frame of reference, I nodded in agreement. You were still in the shadow of those older kids. Often the place we live, the neighborhood we shared, comes up in the news. A shooting here, a stabbing there. I would have a quiet moment for you each time. Your father's words ring in my head clear as a bell. Break the chains, black men. You never heard them. Why did you leave early? Okay, I'll read this one. I don't think I've, I don't think I've read this one um, in public before. So this one is called The Assistant Manager. He knew a little bit about everything. The assistant manager could speak on Mourinho's inter soccer team, Lucky Dubé, and the ins and outs of tractors. My sister and I were his team and we were well coached. Weekend shopping trips to Woodbine, Sherway, Sheridan, and Bramley, the venue did not matter. We always won. He was more tactically aware than the soccer experts on the score and TSN. I would tell him to audition and show them up. He would laugh it off as he did most things, I said. He would tell it to you straight. No need for bells or whistles. He would tell it to you straight. The way you had to hear it, a firm voice from a warm smile. He wasn't as serious as the navigator. Humor and sarcasm held his frame together. I held hope that I would reach his six feet. I didn't. I remember seeing his broad shoulders go down our hallway, headed to work while I slipped out of a dream. Night shift and I never once heard him complain, not once. He taught me that manhood was about keeping your word and doing the thing, no matter how hard. He felt like what I imagined an older brother would be. The assistant manager would slip secret $5 bills here and there. Two fifty dollars each, he would say. I would spend my share as soon as I got it, straight to the tuck shop, for a $2 surprise bag. You never knew what each one would be. When I hovered above the striped blue and white bags, I was in Destiny's hands. You could rip the paper and staples of your bag and look inside first, but I never did. I would always stick my hand in and pull out each item. I loved being caught off guard. Leukemia, radiation, St. Michael's. I didn't know what these things were. I wanted to put them back in the surprise bag and staple it shut. I wanted to hand that bag back to the tuck shop owner and never carry it home with me. The assistant manager was big and indestructible. I felt like a titan on his shoulders. He went from stocky and strong to rail thin and weak. His shoulders were no longer travel options. I learned that cancer had a scent. I could smell it on him. The scent couldn't be washed away, not even by my mother's tears. She would go back and forth, St. Michael's and home, home, then St. Michael's. How could something so bad happen to someone so good? Mother took care of her brother, like how my older sister would take care of me. We no longer got into formation for our shopping trips. When I would go see the assistant manager, he was a prisoner of his bed, immobile with gaunt cheeks. His hospital room was separated in half with a thin curtain. The smell of the bedpan from the other side hung in my nose and stayed there, each subway ride home. His shoulders had become narrower. His whole frame was held together by resistance, beaten down by radiation. He looked as small as a child under that hospital blanket. I hated seeing the assistant manager looking that weak. I was so scared for him. Imagine how scared he must have been. Yet each time we went to St. Michael's, he greeted me with a smile. 
We couldn't speak for hours about Arsenal and Manchester United anymore. He got tired faster, and I would have to leave his bedside sooner than I would have liked. Yet despite the smell and his condition, he still teased my sister and me, putting smiles on our faces. He was the brightness peeking through the dark curtain that enveloped us. His surprise bag was probably the worst one you could pick out, but he remained as resilient as Mourinho's inter-team. He never felt sorry for himself. He defied destiny, he taught me that. At last he had broken free from that hospital bed. His body responded well to the treatment. The sarcasm-filled shopping trips with my sister came back. We were a winning team again. Despite all he had been through, he held no bitterness. Not an ounce of anger radiated off him. He taught me so much by not even speaking. He taught me the value of having a role model who wasn't as formal as the navigator. I realized later that he had never been weak. The assistant manager was strong the whole time. This is called New Ones Old. Another night spent with another girl, another phase of renewal. Treating new girls like the old ones, wishing old ones were more like the new. All the contacts in your phone starting to blur. Seated in shadow with a new girl among used furniture. Darkness illuminated only by intention. Shrieking with our internal mouths. Wordless warnings, piercing fat silence. Daring not to reveal how lonely you really were. Ensuring your aloofness remained intact. This wasn't love or anything silly. Love is weakness, love is needy. You refused to need anyone. You vowed never to get hurt. Refusing to reveal your pain. Just sailing onward together at a distance. Ignoring floodlight, sidelight, Steering our shared steel ship straight to mist. Ropes of union tightened with each movement. No life left in these rafts. This one, this is called December 31st, 1899. Dear Mountain Hermit, the old ways are dead and dying. Many a prospector down in Yuma then said the same. Rushing gold rivers has since run dry. We represent a time long since past. Like old musty garments of sown bison skin, we are discarded by the destitute. The sun done set on the west. Manifest destiny has turned the other way. Civilization is a heedless train. The phone lines tell it true. They are, they are a scar on the land of the frontier. Signed, Progress and its Myths. Mm -hmm.